<laughs> Welcome to um, Cosplay Q&A with me, Mink the Seder. Um, I'm here to answer your questions. So if you've got them, bring them to me. If you don't got them, then I'm just going to start talking about some of my favorite things, which I mean, that's fine, but I'm here to answer your questions, not necessarily to entertain you. So. Hey there, Jags Cosplay, have you got a question? I do. So I didn't get to stay on too late last night for the photography panel, and I didn't really get to hear too much on the cosplayer's point of view with photographers, but I was wondering because I've been doing cons now for a while, and I actually this year was the first time I was going to set up with photographers at Anime Boston and all the ones that we say RIP to right now for trip. <laughs> Yeah, but um, I was wondering, how do you build that connection with a photographer? Because it's really hard, and it seems like the, a lot of photographers have the cosplayers they like working with, but it's really hard if you haven't, like, engaged them yet. I was wondering if you had any tips for that. Oh, 100%. So, yeah, right now, I'm sure when you're coming in new, it feels like everybody knows everybody else, and you're just, like, that kid pressed up against the glass being like, I want the train set. Um, I promise it's just because many of us keep going to the same conventions over and over and running into the same people over and over. So for me, I think the best way to make a connection to a photographer that you admire is ahead of time to let the photographer know that you admire their work. Nothing opens a door quite like a compliment. And so I have been following some of my favorite photographers online for some time, commenting on how great their photos are and um, letting them know like, listen, I really value what you're doing. I noticed that you're favoring this kind of filter. Can you talk more about it? Like just much like making a friend, it's all about in being genuinely interested in getting to know that person as a person. Uh, some, of my, some of my best friends are photographers. No, for real though, I have a friend that I am deeply close with. Like not a day goes by that we don't at least message each other on Facebook. I met him at a photo shoot, but like didn't really get to know him because his work was just so good and I was really intimidated and I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to like look like a scrub. But then like one of my friends told me like, oh yeah, I talk to him all the time. Like he's wicked nice. So finally I got off of my like scared little high horse and messaged him and was just like, I really like your work. I'd love to work with you again if you're down for it. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. What are you doing this weekend? So we wound up setting up a photo shoot with my other more gregarious than me friend. We had a blast. And ever since then, we've been in constant communication. So again, some of it is just opening the door and starting that interaction. And if you guys click like a friendship, then that interaction is going to be golden. A lot of us at conventions are just friends with our photographers. We just happen to be cosplayers and we happen to be photographers, but we're friends first. Hopefully that's a sufficient answer. That's my perspective. I'm sure someone else is coming to be like, eh, it's not how it works for me. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> oh, that's great to hear. But you could be my friend. I don't take photos, but <laughs> I'll be your friend. <laughs> You were really I know, that's gonna be as helpful. That. You were really nice at taxis. I was like very timid, like, oh, I know her, and went over like my prompto costume and you had like your uh, Oh my god, that's right. Uh, yes, I remember your prompto costume. <laughs> I had him yeah, on I get very today. Yes. <laughs> it's it's hard to recognize people in different costumes, I've found. Because uh, I'm I, a scrub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. It's just I screwed up a lot of people. The thing that I always do is I always like grow out the facial hair and like I'll do like Klaus or Geralt and then I shave it the next day. So all the people I met, like they're just like, who are you? Who am I talking to? To me, the funniest thing I've ever heard feedback wise is I had a friend. We're a lot closer now than we were at the time. But at the time, they said their first impression of me was that I was like very, um, very like 
status, very noble, very graceful and like hard to approach. And I was like, are we talking about the same me? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a dork and a nerd and you should very much look down upon me. <laughs> so, hey, I'm happy that I've curated a social media portfolio that makes it seem like I'm this unattainable, like high echelon person. I promise I'm, I'm as prone to imposter syndrome as the next bitty. Possibly more so. Yeah, anxiety. <laughs> my my pride, my my anxiety pride showing through. <laughs> yeah, that happens at all the cons when someone comes up to talk to me and I'm just like, why are you talking to me? <laughs> One second, let me pretend to be someone else real quick. I mean, isn't that this the heart of cosplay? I will you- say this, the greatest thing I feel like I've ever contributed to the cosplay community was doing scavenger hunts. Uh, My early uh, life in cosplay, I would make business cards that on the back of it had a scavenger hunt and I would run a a convention long scavenger hunt. So I would wear the same costume all weekend as opposed to changing out every day or even multiple times a day, which God, I don't have the energy to do that anymore. Anyway, I did a Borderlands one once where one of the objectives for the scavenger hunt was that you needed to get the autograph of one of the Borderlands characters, Handsome Jack, who's this very like pompous, arrogant character. So I sent random convention goers to find random people. I didn't know anyone who was cosplaying as Handsome Jack to that convention, but I knew that it was gonna be a popular costume because it was like, I think it was the year that Borderlands 2 had come out. So I knew it was going to be a popular costume. It was like a surefire bet that there'd be at least somebody. But I met so many amazing people because they were like, oh, you're the person that people keep asking for my autograph for. Hearing those people share their stories of how someone went up to them and said like, oh my God, can I get your autograph? That was like, it made their day, which in turn made my day. So uh, I encourage cosplayers to consider doing sweet scavenger hunts because they're really fun and they can make other people feel like a million bucks. I can imagine. That sounds like an awesome idea. (laughs) It was really cute. I've done, I haven't done scavenger hunts in quite some time, unfortunately, typically because now I've shifted my focus to doing more panels at conventions, which means I'm not as available to do the scavenger hunts. It was much easier for me to run them when it was like, I'm just a wandering person within the context of a giant convention. And if people find me again, mazel tov, that's part of the challenge of the scavenger hunt. I just don't have the stamina for it anymore. But God, it was so much fun. If you're that kind of person who gets like your joie de vie is achieved when other people are happy, I 10 out of 10 encourage you to do a scavenger hunt at a convention. That stuff's bananas good. Oh, add that to the list. Oh, yeah. 100. 100. Going to keep on jiving as I wait for more questions to come in. And if you've got more questions, just fire away. Might as well. Seems like we got a quiet one. Um, so what's in your necessary toolbox for cosplay? I know like you do like lever clap and EVA foam and sewing and everything else, but what's like you had to pick up and go and only could take like one box. What's the stuff that like you're bringing? Is it like special effects, small tools? Yeah, if I had to like live in my car and the only things that I could take with me like was just limited space content, the sewing machine and my fabric scissors would certainly come with me because that is my personal like place of, of interest. But um, I think a craft mat, for sure, a box cutter, um, a knife sharpener definitely would make it to the list, uh, just because I don't want to have to keep buying uh, sharp objects. Uh, I use the stick sharpener, the one where you just, you know, if you've seen the chefs Mm -hmm. take a knife and hang, you know, throw it down on a stick at an angle really quick. What they're actually doing is they're... um, they're taking the burrs of, at the end of a knife and they're just realigning them to, to that point again. Um, but I haven't purchased a box cutter or blade in like a year and a half because I've just been 
um, uh, realigning those burrs again so I can have sharp cuts. I probably also bring a heat gun with me. Um, and of course, if I'm bringing a heat gun, a glue gun, those things, I mean, those are what cures what ails you. Those are, those are what I would consider essential components to any cosplayer's toolkit, just because, again, the amount of versatility that you would have with all of those tools is, is pretty strong. This doesn't count consumables because clearly a costume when you're making it has consumables. Like I'm not going, when I need fabric for a costume, I'm not buying fabric, like just the abstract concept of it. I'm buying specific fabric for a specific project. If I could just throw money and get fabric and it would just magically become anything that I wanted, like, you know, some stem cell, that'd be incredible. But that is unrealistic. So I wouldn't bring fabric with me because I'd have to just buy it wherever I went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Welcome those who joined. Um, this is an open session. So if you have a question, please feel free to um, unmute yourself to ask it. Or if you're feeling uh, shy or you don't want to hear your voice, or if you're not comfortable being recorded because this is a recorded session, then you can go ahead and um, write your question in the comments too. I got a question. What since, you got? Since you do Pokemon cosplays, what's your uh, top five favorite Pokemon? Okay, top five favorite Pokemon, not cosplay, just favorite Pokemon. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, Mimikyu's at the top of the list. It's the patron stand of cosplay. Yeah. Like that's just like a, a no brainer. Um, I'm obsessed with hedgehogs, so Shaman's got to be up there. I don't know if Shaman's number two, but Shaman's definitely high up there. Uh, favorite evolution would be Flareon, so I'm going to put Flareon in the list. Um, Raichu was my favorite Pokemon when I was in the seventh grade, so I'm going to put Raichu ubiquitously in that list. Um, and number five, huh? I don't know. Number five could really, like, it kind of depends on the day. When I was a kid, um, Sandshrew was up there, so maybe I'll just say Sandshrew, just because that's like my childhood list. This is a very like bizarre list because I'm kind of skipping all over the gens. I can tell you who my least favorite Pokemon is. Who's that? I've got two least favorite Pokemon. It's Klefki and Comfrey. Those are things, they're not Pokemon. It's like someone in the design team was like looking around their house. They were like, man, I got to pad out the numbers. Uh, hey, keys, keys with a face. And we'll say that this Pokemon steals other keys. That'll be their backstory. It's like, get off. Oh, we're doing a Hawaii version, like the Hawaii take of Pokemon. Let's make a lay with a face. I don't know. I don't know. I, I have some moral objections. The only reason why Trubbish is not on that list is because Trubbish is actually a very tight design. I adore trash bag Pokemon deeply. I adore that its evolution is when there's so much trash that the bag bursts. That one gets a pass. Everyone else. Sorry, could you say that again? It got a little garbled on my end. Oh, I didn't enjoy the, uh, the Raichu uh, Hawaiian. Yeah, the Alolan Raichu does, does kick some booty. I like that they're trying to give it, like, there was a whole surfing Pikachu moment, but then Raichu was like, surfing Pikachu! And then you give it a Thunderstone, and we don't care about it anymore! Um, so they, they gave it a, a surfing Raichu to, to hang 10 with, with Pikachu, and I, I think that was, that was a good move. Mm -hmm. So many people, like, have such hatred for Raichu because it's not Pikachu and they don't want their OG Ash's Pikachu to ever evolve. And I'm like, man, but Raichu's cute too. Come on. Yeah. Not every Raichu is, uh, is the Lieutenant Surge's Raichu. <laughs> Lieutenant Surge. That's, that's a, that's a deep cut. So, uh, in the chat, we've got a question. Why did I choose Pokemon instead of Digimon? Because Pokemon was on before school. And because Pokemon was a video game, I was already playing. I, I wish I, that was 
like they, I had a better answer than that. But the reality is that Pokemon was a game I played first. And when a television show came out that was related to it, I was like, heck yes, I'm in. Um, that show was everything. And it was on before I went to school. So when I was a kid, I would watch the episode. I would draw a Pokemon that was featured in that episode. Because in season one of Pokemon, they were like, one Pokemon per episode is featured. So it'd be like, today's Pokemon is Weedle. So I would draw like a picture of Weedle and I'd bring it to my class and I would give it away to, you know, a kid in my class who wanted it. And then when I came home, they would just replay the same episode and I'd watch it again. Uh, I don't know why I never really got into Digimon. It's, it was just, I guess when I was a kid, it was just too similar to Pokemon and I was, I was already full. So um, I know a lot of folks are ride or die Digimon. They say the story is better. I believe them. It was just not something that I had gotten into because if there was a video game, I didn't play it. All right, looking for more questions, questions about cosplay, questions for me in general, whatever. I'm happy to answer. We've got time and this is just fun and silly. This is for you. I have another crafting question. Yeah, go for it. Um, so the more I drew that picture, the more I actually do want to do a Jinjinki Appa because I'm like, oh, yeah. oh so cool. And I was thinking like the white fur, is it possible? I'm sure you can, but I can also see where there'd be problems. Like, so I was thinking again, like white fur, but he has the arrow going down his head and back. And I'm afraid if I spray paint that, it's just going to make the fur, like the fake fur clump. It will. That's yeah. very true. So when it comes to fur, you really do have a couple of different approaches. You can dye fur using um, a special technique. It's very complicated. You take acrylic ink, not, um, not acrylic paint, but acrylic ink, and you do a, two, uh, a one part to one part pour um, with 70% isopropyl alcohol. If you do a one to one ratio of the two, put it in a spray bottle, give it a nice good shake and spritz it, you'll be able to dye your um, fur pile pretty easily without the fur necessarily clumping or becoming crunchy, which is what you would usually get if you spray paint. This is also a technique that you can use to dye wigs. Something to keep in mind is that control will be really difficult if you're using spray paint, um, So I, or if you're using um, a spritzer. So I definitely discourage that over just buying um, a different color fur and just doing a color block. That way you can be sure that um, the entire fur piece from root to tip is colored in. There's another way that you can do precision styling and coloring of fake fur, and that involves using uh, an alcohol-based marker. If you're not already picking up on the theme, when it comes to dyeing wigs or fake fur, you want to use an alcohol-based uh, inking system rather than a water-based system uh, or like a tempera, because tempera is just going to gum everything up. Do not use tempera. So um, if you're doing precise coloration for a wig or for faux fur, you could get like a Copic marker and you could then, wearing gloves, individually color in every single strand that you want colored. That's probably the best way to get the precise lines without having any seams, but for the amount of work that that takes and the amount of money that it takes buying alcohol markers, which alcohol-based markers are at least $7, usually $7 to $13 a pop, and for some projects you're looking at like three to five markers to do it, that adds up. If you're going to spend that money, you might as well just buy a second tone of faux fur and then just piecemeal it in. So if you're working on an Appa cosplay and you want that arrow that Appa has, because Appa's got cream colored fur and an arrow in brown, then I would just say buy the cream colored fur, 
and then buy a little bit of the brown fur and just cut that arrow shape in the fake fur and cut and and sew it in because I think that will give you a better overall look. Okay. I wound up being also a low key tip on how to do uh, color gradients for wig work. That is a wonderful tip if you're trying to create an ombre with your wig. You can create an ombre using um, synthetic wig dye or like synthetic dye um, and doing a, a pot dyeing technique where you use like dye in a boiling pot and you submerge part of the wig that you want to be a color for a short time and then you pull it a little bit out and you let the rest submerge for a little bit and then you pull a little out and so you'd create that ombre that way but that way it can be difficult to control and sometimes it can be um, very messy or challenging. I found just as much luck using the um, the acrylic ink and isopropyl alcohol mix in a spray bottle, that's been just fine by me too. So you could kind of do things lots of ways. If you are gonna do it though, do it either outside or in a place that you've laid down plenty of like tarps and things because sprays that contain dye get everywhere. <laughs> and if you're looking over in the chat, our moderator Crystal Elhart has said, um, those of you who are just joining, this is a live audience-led Q&A. So if you want to ask a question, we are recording. So if you're okay with having your voice or your image um, being recorded, then you can just un unmute uh, and show us video if you want to ask your question. If you don't want to do that, you can just type it in the chat. I'll read it out loud and then I'll ask, answer it that way. So I see we've got a question from Cheshire. Do I alter my cosplay to adapt to the weather or do I just stick to an exact replica? <sighs> That's a grand question. I know that I should alter my cosplay to, uh, to adapt to the weather, but the reality is that I tend to go more for uh, a, an accurate retelling when I'm doing cosplay as opposed to an interpretation like right now I'm wearing technically I'm cosplaying as a as a rattata but this is this is just casual for me I'm enjoying being comfortable right now when I do cosplay as like a full reproduction of an intellectual property like Raven from Teen Titans or um, Aloy from Horizon Zero Dawn I tend to make the character representation exactly as it is appeared in whatever genre they appear in because I'm focusing on recognizability. I'm assuming therefore that the place that I'm wearing this costume is climate controlled. So if I'm at a convention, I'm assuming that they have amenities such as air conditioning. So if I'm in a very heavy costume or a costume that has a lot of leather like Aloy, I would be comfortable but there are some costumes that I won't wear during certain times of year simply because it's inappropriate and I would freeze or boil respectively. So when I am in, like if I attend Dragon Con in Atlanta, Georgia at the end of the summer, that's a bad time to wear a costume that's all leather or all foam, something that won't breathe and I'll like boil alive. Similarly, if I'm in Boston in the middle of winter, I'm not gonna wear a skimpy little outfit, or at least not without having some form of covering that I could take off once I get to a climate controlled area. So to that end, I do somewhat plan my cosplays according to the season, uh, just because I want to be comfortable. I don't want to freeze or boil respectively. I will always err on the side of being too cold rather than being too hot because I can always put more on, but there comes a place where I really can't take anything off and that itself can be uncomfortable too. I can't take my skin off, par exemple. That was a good question, thank you. Feel free, those of you who are joining, feel free to um, uh, ask, questions by unmuting yourself or answering stuff in the chat. If you're just heading to a breakout room, hi and bye. <laughs> Let 
don't be shy. I'm here for you. I, I hate saying don't be shy because of course, as soon as you say don't be shy, it's like everyone's like, but I am shy, now what? Don't tell me what to or not be. <laughs> All right, so I've got a question over in the chat from Amanda, do I ever use body suits for skin color? Yes. Um, this is particularly true if I am doing something like, so this would be in the context like of uh, an alienoid creature, some something with a non-standard, like I'm not going to change my skin tone to match a realistic skin tone because that's really inappropriate. Um, but if I were to say uh, cosplay as a, an orc with green skin, yes, I, I've definitely worn um, fabrics or body suits to give that illusion. Um, one thing I find really helpful is that once you are in a bodysuit, so if you even buy a Zentai suit that's all one color, you can add some dimension by, um, by airbrushing some highlights and lowlights, and that can create a more uh, authentic look and look more like skin rather than looking like just a bodysuit. So I would definitely recommend if you have the ability to either put a Zentai suit on a dummy or have a friend help you airbrush um, to add some texture, some shadows or dimensions. It's very much like that superhero bodysuit kind of look. Um, we've got another question. How do you go about getting a bodysuit made for you? And what materials or uh, would I suggest for, for crafting it? There are tons of companies that are cosplay friendly that sell bodysuits. If you're looking for one that's custom made for you, then, I mean, yes, you can look for um, like individuals who are doing uh, like their own, like I'll make you a bodysuit thing. By all means, the internet is a vast resource and I certainly encourage folks to, to seek it out. Um, always read reviews and listen to other folks. Uh, your individual mileage may vary. But if you wanna make a bodysuit for yourself, I recommend using a Lycra or a, not, um, a spandex. Um, those are great stretch fabrics. You can look for uh, dance wear material is what you're really gonna be looking for, something that stretches. Ideally, you should look for fabric that stretches uh, two different ways. They actually call it four-way stretch because it can stretch both uh, laterally and longitudinally. If you only can find fabric in the color that you like that has that lateral stretch, then make sure that your two-way stretch stretches laterally and you don't have it longitudinally, longitudinally because the reality is you want that bodysuit to hug your curves. You want it to hug like all the places on you you don't need it to be longer, you need it to ten potentially be wider. It is a little challenging at first trying to figure out how to pattern or how to sew a bodysuit to your exact form. I'd say the easiest thing to do is to just not include a seam allowance because then you can just, um, you can just assume that the stretch is going to be accounted for or is going to account for any seam allowance. So if you cut it to your exact measurements, you should be fine. When you do sew stretch material, be sure to sew with a zigzag stitch. That's going to help so that your stitches don't pop because especially if you've ever found like any cheap Zentai suits and you tried to wear it and it has a running stitch, those stitches pop so easily because the stitch isn't really conducive to any stretch, whereas a zigzag will encourage you to have um, a stretch in the seam as well. So even if you look at like a pair of underwear or swim trunks or a bathing suit, you'll see that any part where elastic has to stretch, you'll see the zigzag stitch was used because they want to give you that opportunity to have some, some pull, some tension um, can still exist within the seam. So again, for those who are joining, this is a live Q&A. So if you have a question, please just 
unmute yourself and ask or feel free to write it in the comments. I'm, I'm here for you. This is your time. I am just a talking head. Do -do 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 talking head with the dance moves. I swear I'm really cool. I can dance like a white chick. Otherwise, I'm just going to like talk about my day. Well, this morning I woke up and I had a piece of toast. That's a, that's a Futurama reference for those uninitiated. All right, over in the chat, um, the question is, what is my favorite crafting thing to do? I think I love sewing. It is my go-to. It is something that comes not naturally, but it's something that over time I've become really accustomed to it. I think my favorite obscure, obscure uh, crafting thing to do is leatherworking. Those of you who may have gotten to see the leatherworking panel this morning um, or got to see the recording of the leatherworking panel from this morning will see that it is a very easy thing to just jump into and do. It's super easy. It's not as scary as one might think. And if I do literally nothing in my life as a costumer, I want only to accomplish that people acknowledge that leatherworking is not as scary or as challenging as it looks. <laughs> Anytime I, I submit leatherworking for a cosplay competition or the like, um, judges are always like, oh my god, leatherworking. I'm like, don't give me credit. It's not that. Get out of here please. I mean, I'll take it, but like, don't sing my praises today. Not over that. <laughs> um, those of you who might have missed the leatherworking panel, we did get a recording of it, so hopefully you will be able to catch it in post. And as always, if you have any leatherworking questions and you don't think to ask me now, you can always ask me in the future at any time, I will respond to whatever social media platform you message me on. Um, and our moderator does say in the chat that the leatherworking panel is up on both YouTube and Facebook. So that is something that you can check out where you can see me broadcasting from my basement. I'm sure there's only a mild echo because it's a basement are not designed like rooms to be ideal for communication and Zoom discussion. So sorry about the echo. I'm gonna have to ask my own questions if you don't if you don't jump in. I, I need you. I need you. You're my only hope. <laughs> oh, there is one in the chat. Have you ever oh. used a prop to make it look like a Pokemon attack or some sort of other effect? <laughs> oh man, um, kind of. I've used, I've usually when I make a prop, I make it um, look like a weapon just because weapons are a very accessible prop. I have, however, made props look like a, a particular thing. So like, I made a shield for my Zubat cosplay to look like a tribal Galbat. So it was like a tribal thing that a Zubat would totally, like my tribal warrior Zubat would totally have, but I did it intentionally in the shape of Galbat because I thought that that would be a fun nod. Or when I did a Weepin' Bell cosplay, I had two props that were really stupid. Um, I did Weepin' Bell, as Belle from Beauty and the Beast in the yellow dress. It was a cosplay that designed itself. And I had a bell jar. And instead of having Belle from Beauty and the Beast's wilting rose, which I guess is technically Beast's wilting rose, I did a bell sprout. So I made a bell sprout prop. Um, and then in my hair as Belle, I put I made a um a victory bell that I just clipped into my hair. Just like it was stupid but I liked it. It was a fun effect. And for the people who thought I was just like Belle from Beauty and the Beast, they were like, hey, that's a really nice Belle costume. But for the people who like saw what it was and it's terrible pun, they would see moments like that and be like, I hate you. And I hate you. And I hate you. And that's what I did it for. The hatred. 
I really just wanted people to look at a costume and be like, oh, I see what you did there. Ugh. It's very rewarding when I get like the pun grown. The pun grown, I think, is what I live off of. I have yet to use a prop for a special effect. Like I've yet to make a prop for like a water type Pokemon that looks like I'm in the middle of a water attack. But that's a brilliant idea. And I think there's a lot that can be done with that. Oh, I guess I did not fireballs. What are you talking about? Made a yeah, I made a fireball for Bowsette. Uh, off screen, my, my boyfriend's like, didn't you make a fireball for something? I did. I did make a fireball for when I cosplayed as Bowsette. And I would just hold it and it was this, it looked like a floating fireball. Not quite Pokemon, but you know, kind of on brand. It was a Gajinka. It's still Nintendo. <laughs> yeah, it's still Nintendo. I didn't go that far. <laughs> good point. Good point. Apparently I have a brand. Unfortunately, I've hitched my wagon to a brand that pays no attention to its cosplayers and does not care. Maybe that's for the best. <laughs> um, Amanda asks what my favorite pop I ever made was. I am awfully fond of my bow for Aloy from Horizon Zero Dawn. That one was an experience. I like to make a cosplay per month. The year that I made that cosplay, I considered the bow to be my November cosplay. It really was like the process that went into it. I think it took me something like somewhere between 50 and 100 hours to make the bow. Oh, thank you, boyfriend. Off camera, my boyfriend was handing it to me because it happens to be in my living room. This is my bow. It is very long. I think it's something close to like 172 centimeters, I think is the measurement. Um, I know because Horizon Zero Dawn has a, um, they had a, a character guide. It was kind of like a cosplay guide. And they had a photo of the bow from the game. So it's just the game rendering, but they, um, they put down what the full dimension from tip to tip was, which I very much appreciated because then what I did is I took the picture and I created a blueprint for myself where I drew the lowest point and then the next highest point and the next highest point. So it was almost like making a topographical map. And the reason why I did this was because rather than 3D print my bow, I wanted to make it out of foam. I don't have a 3D printer, nor do I have access to a 3D printer. So, or at least not at the time. So I was very, very aware of my own limitations. So by making this topographical map, I was able to break down piece by piece what thickness of foam I needed and where I needed to place it in relation to the other foams. So what I did was ultimately make just this rise. It was in many ways like 3D printing, just with thicker pieces of foam. Once I did that, I covered the prop entirely in Warbla um, piece by piece before putting them all together because I knew that this prop was going to get manhandled. And any prop that you think you're going to be passing off to someone that could potentially be damaged, it's a good idea to coat it in some sort of thermoplastic because that really does protect the longevity and rigidity of the, the prop that you've got. I've seen far too many of my friends have props break on them woefully because somebody was not being careful with it. No, never the original prop maker, of course. It's always like some other person. So I'd say that one was the one, the thing that I feel the most proud of. Um, I do have a companion set of arrows. They're not up on this floor with me. I actually have them in my basement where I um, partnered with uh, one of my friends is a historical archer. So I partnered with him to make historically accurate uh, arrows. Uh, the tips were made out of warbla because I had to make them appropriate to bring with me to conventions, but everything else from the fletching to the wrapping um, and the decorative wrapping that was all done 
by, uh, by the book with the historical methods. So that felt very good to be a part of that and to help recreate a little bit of history too. It certainly made me feel really proud. Let them questions like arrows, let them questions fly. <laughs> if I could be any Pokemon, what would it be? Oh crap, this is where I wish I had like a pre-canned response. I mean, I think I'd probably be like an Eevee or a Ditto, something that's capable of transformation. Um, I think I'd probably wind up being a Ditto just because again, like that's like the classic canned response from a cosplayer. But I do like the idea that, you know, in my home life, I'm just this gross pink blob, but I can look at something and transform myself and be whatever I want, but then I can always revert to the comfort of my pink blobbiness. I do. Oh, thank you for saying that that was deep. <laughs> I also get a fun ditto face. So fun fact, I am planning on cosplaying all 151 of the original uh, Gen 1 Pokemon, which means like somewhere kicking in my head, I have these like half fleshed out ideas of a uh, Pokemon cosplay for that particular gen of Pokemon. And I do have an idea for Ditto. I want to do a Rococo Ditto because the silhouette of the Rococo era gown is the same silhouette of a Ditto. It would be very easy for me to get a froofy fan that I could fan myself with that would have the dumb Ditto face on it so I could walk about my day with the stupid ditto face on it. But because I would be wearing a giant Rococo gown, I also get the ability of making my dress have the ability to transform. So I was experimenting with like, and this is all like mental thoughts. I have nothing written down, but I was experimenting with the idea of having the skirt open up and to have a Pokemon painted on the inside of the skirt so I could transform that way. And then there's another, uh, transformation that could be achieved. There is a method where you can take uh, the bottom of a skirt and through use of these uh, like sewn in poles basically, you can pull it over your head and have the fabric come over your head to frame yourself. So if I'm very careful about how I do skirts and underskirts, I'd be able to make the back of the dress then transform, much like a peacock's feathers just come on up and then under on the underside of the skirt, I could have another Pokemon painted on. So I would be able to raise that like a peacock, turn around and be another Pokemon. So that's what I was um, playing around with as far as the idea for Ditto. Have I done anything to make it manifest? No, not yet. Uh, I will at some point. That would be a very big build. It would require a lot of fabrics and a little bit of engineering to figure out what I need to make certain um, transformation elements happen. So knowing me, I would probably do um, something on a small scale just to test like the proof of concept before going full tilt, just because I would be a little reluctant to sink that much money into a project without knowing that it would certainly or could certainly work. So that's a little insight into something that I think about. Oftentimes I'll have these ideas for a costume kicking around my brain for like a couple of months to a couple of years before I actually pull trigger. And then when I do, I'm like, ha ha, I did the thing. It just took me a while because I had to think about it. And that sounds really deep, but it's not. I just, it's like, I have to sit down and be like, okay, but how would I actually do the thing? Anybody got other questions I can answer? As I sit here doing my little dance. And if you have your own projects, feel free to ask questions related to your own projects too. Uh, so one of the questions in the chat is, if I could have any cosplay made right now, what is it? So like I make it or someone else makes it and it appears before me because I would prefer to make it myself. There's a little bit of pride in there. Not that I don't love collaborating with people, but as my boyfriend so uh, eloquently put it, when I'm wearing a, a piece that someone else made and I get compliments on it, he says that it looks like a little part of my soul dies every time someone's like, 
hey, I really like your sword. I'm like, thanks, someone else made it for me. Here's all their information. I'm happy to share that. But uh, from a pride perspective, I'm like, oh, but I wish I made it. Hmm. Um, but that's just because it's the constant crafter's dilemma. Um, especially when it's, I've made everything else, but then when I let someone know, like, oh yes, yeah, someone else made this, it somehow devalues the rest of what I've done. It doesn't actually, this is all in my head. Um, if I could have a cosplay of mine that I, you know, magically, I found the motivation, time and space to make it. I think my, uh, uh, I want it to make Rapidash, the Pokemon, as a working centaur. I have all the supplies to do it. I just need to actually pull trigger and do it. Um, so I think that would be the cosplay that I'd be like, boom, and I've just mentally forgot all of the suffering and pain that goes into making a cosplay, and it's just done, and it's ready, and I'm so happy it's done. Um, so I see in the comments, um, Find That Potato says that they are just starting a cosplay. Do I recommend buying or making your first costume? And that's up to you. It would be entirely up to you whether you want to buy or make your first costume because as a cosplayer, it doesn't matter if you've made your costume. You can just wear whatever. The only time it matters is if you're competing. That's it. No one really deeply cares if you made it um, or if you got it commissioned or if you purchased it. I'd say if you're the kind of person who needs every seam to be perfect, then it might behoove you to buy your first cosplay rather than make it. If you're the kind of person who enjoys an experience and enjoys producing things, then it's certainly uh, gonna be very enjoyable and very rewarding to make your own costume. I will say that um, if you are gonna make a costume for the very first time, I would deeply encourage you to start with something simple before going on to something more elaborate. Uh, I would rather help a friend work on making uh, like a Miyazaki costume, like maybe San from Spirited Away can, has some pretty uh, simplistic designs that you can always elevate versus doing like some crazy World of Warcraft armor. That's just my personal opinion, but I think that um, accomplishing and learning how to do the basics before evolving into something more complex is going to save you a lot of heartache and it's going to help you gain the confidence to try something more challenging as you move forward. There's nothing wrong with trying to bite off more than you can chew at the very beginning. It just can feel really defeating if the vision that you have in your head doesn't match what you produce in reality. And I've certainly experienced that and I've been with friends who have experienced that. It can be very defeating to then wanna keep going. So if you start simple with your first project and then build up a repertoire of basics before you move on to something more elaborate, then you'll feel more confident and have, the, uh, have that confidence to try more challenging projects. I also see in the comments that if you want a uh, semi-made, uh, for example, uh, Amanda's doing a cosplay where uh, they have bought a skirt and a top and they're editing it to look more like the character. That's a brilliant way to dip your big toe into the waters of cosplay rather than fabricating wholesale or purchasing a costume wholesale. You can do cosplay like Frankensteining you can do modifications where you buy something that's close but or you own something that's close but needs to be modified and that's a great way to understand how costume construction works how fabric lays um and you will get a better if you've never sewn before there's a higher chance that what you will get will match what your vision is so i'm a big big proponent of trying um, um cosplay modification or Frankensteining as your entryway. Um, so we've got about 10 more minutes. I'm so jazzed to answer more of your questions. So please feel free to shoot them my way. Do, do, do. 
Um, Amanda asks, what is my least favorite cosplay? That's great, because, like, I often talk about my cosplay as being, like, my babies, like, my children. Um, and so when people are like, what's your favorite? I'm like, I can't pick from my babies, but least favorite. You better believe I could pick from my least favorite. Um, I have a couple of least favorites, but for different reasons. Like, I have one costume that I liked so little, it's never seen the light of day. Uh, I did a tentacruel costume that the original version of the tentacruel costume had a, like a unitard that had like tentacles hanging all which way about it. And it was, it just didn't look like I wanted it to. And so I wound up chucking the unitard and I remade it as a mermaid gown six months later. Uh, that's usually what defines a least favorite cosplay is if like I go through, I make it, and then I'm just so unenthused about it that I refuse to even wear it to a convention. I'm That Potato asks, uh, what are wig websites and stores that I like? Um, many years ago, I was like, ride or die Arda. Arda Wigs is still like the premier cosplay wig central. I enjoy Arda Wigs and Epic Cosplay Wigs very, very much because they come in regimented colors and different styles. And I appreciate that because sometimes I need my hair to be a very specific blonde. Oftentimes I'll go to Arda because they also sell wig wefts. So uh, if I'm making a cosplay where I need to have blue hair, I don't have to buy two blue wigs and then use those wefts to pad in like I would in any other circumstance. I can just buy the blue base wig and then I can buy some wig wefts and add on to it. And I appreciate that. Um, another question that I get from uh, Jags Cosplay is, do I have any suggestions on how to make horns like a bull? Should you go with foam or is there a different thermoplastic you should look at? When it comes to any headpiece, light weight. That's because your head has a lot of nerve ending. And if you're wearing something heavy, you're going to feel it after a while. So I'm a much stronger proponent of using foam rather than using like resin or even warbler coating. Um, Evil Ted has a wonderful pattern for making bull horns. He has a couple of different um, a couple of different shapes that you can use. Uh, his horns are a four-piece horn. It comes up with a beautiful, beautiful shape. I will say this, if you want to texture your horn so that it has this like almost demonic texture to it, I would use a wood burning tool to, in an open ventilated area, because when you apply heat to foam, it creates vapors that are not pleasant but you can use a wood burning tool to um, etch a grain into your foam that will look absolutely dynamite. I've made uh, so many foam horns at this point, but anytime I've done that kind of wood burn technique, it looks so good that I've had folks come up to me and be like, what is this made out of? Like, I need to understand because it's so textured and real. They don't believe me when I say it's foam. I also find that foam is easier to attach to a headband. Foam is also easier to um, just secure to a wig, generally speaking, it being as lightweight as it is. I never mind wearing horns that are made of foam. As a satyr, I've worn horns that are made out of clay. I've worn horns that are made out of resin. I've made horns that are made out of like horn. Those are the worst because they're very heavy after a few hours of wearing something heavier than foam, you feel it. So I would definitely advise anytime you're wearing something on your head to make it as lightweight as possible. So we have only a couple moments left. So I think I can take one more question before we have to wrap. So if anyone would like to ask the final question, 
I'm here to answer it for you. And I'm just going to jive. Oh my gosh, someone's got to have the final question. No pressure. <laughs> there we go. Um, so I'm that potato says, if you lose a wig cap or a hair cap, um, a wig cap, generally speaking, is what it's called, and you need to make one fast, what would you use to make it? Uh, two things. First thing, if you lose a wig cap, yeah, you could technically just get some pantyhose and make uh, a wig cap out of pantyhose or like a stocking. That works fine. Um, wig caps are fine. They're great. They keep everything together, especially if you have a lot of hair. But let me clue you into something even greater, a wig grip. A wig grip looks like a, um, a length of velvet that Velcros in the back. It goes right along the edge of your hairline, right around your, um, right around your wig cap. And it is phenomenal in keeping your wig in place and keeping it from sliding off of your head. The biggest improvement to my wig tension and my ability to wear wigs for longer periods of time has been a wig grip. Not only does my wig not slide off of my head, but now I no longer need to use bobby pins to secure the wig because the wig grip keeps it from flying back. You can get one on Amazon for like 10 to $15. You can even get them on websites like artawigs.com. So feel free to investigate that. It is genuinely life-changing how much that wig grip has enabled me to wear wigs for longer. All right, everyone, it looks like that is our time. Thank you so much for coming to our panel. Um, thank you for being a part of this experience. There are a couple of panels um, in the back half of WebCon, so I encourage you to take a look. If you had a question and you were not able to ask it or get it answered or you thought of it too late, you can always go to my channel on the Discord and ask me there. Um, thank you so much again. Have a great rest of your convention, everybody. Thank you, Mink, for doing this Q&A panel. Oh, um, genuinely you, my pleasure. Yay. If you guys want to contact Mink or find out ways to follow her, she does have her own channel under Con Guests on our Discord server. So feel free to go on there and then post any more questions you have or how much you love her. <laughs> I mean, I'll take either. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. Take it easy, everybody. Thank you.